This is the sixth panel of the conference so far. My name is Max Cameron. I teach in the Department of Political Science at UBC. Uh, the title of this panel, okay, is that better? The title of this panel is The Trilateral Perspective, Mexico, the United States, uh, and, and Canada. And I think if you, like me, listen to the panels uh, yesterday, um, you, you, and with the sort of uh, an, an interest in uh, to what degree when we speak about North America do we include Mexico, you will, you will have detected a range of different uh, understandings of what, of what North America uh, is. Um, it's interesting that you know, it's now some 20 years since NAFTA was, uh, since NAFTA was uh, initially proposed and there still seems to be uh, no real consensus on to what extent Mexico is part of, of North America. Um, this panel really has two thoughtful and very persuasive advocates of a more trilateral perspective on North America. Uh, our speaker is uh, Bob Pastor, who I'm happy to say I've known for some 20 years and have uh, had the opportunity to listen to and to read and uh, to talk to uh, over those 20 years uh, about many issues concerning uh, North America and more recently the Inter-American Democratic Charter. Uh, he's a distinguished academic, author of numerous uh, books, a uh, number of uh, really critical texts on U.S. Latin American relations in particular. He directs two research centers at American University and before that he was the director of the Latin American and Caribbean program uh, at the Carter Center uh, in, in Atlanta. I think Bob has a remarkable gift for being able to combine both the broad vision uh, with uh, research depth and policy specifics. He's someone who gives the idea of policy relevant research a good name. Uh, so we're really, I think, fortunate to have him today to share his perspective on the idea of a North American community. Jennifer Jeffs is, a, I think, an excellent choice for a discussant. Uh, she's also got very much a trilateral perspective. Um, she's a Canadian, uh, educated uh, at the University of Toronto, uh, who has taught at ITAM in Mexico, is a fellow of CG, and is the president and the CEO of the Canadian International Council. And she has some, prepared some very substantive remarks um, uh, based on, uh, in part, on Bob's, uh, Bob's paper. So before turning the floor over to the speakers, I'd like to begin by going back to something that Jack Citrin said uh, just uh, yesterday. Uh, he made a, an allusion to Ernie Haas's work, and Ernie was a towering figure in the Department of Political Science here, here at Berkeley, uh, who, who I had the fortune of, of studying with. Uh, and, and Ernie developed a functionalist theory of, of, of integration. He wrote a book, the, 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 it was a fabulous book, the title was a little unfortunate, it was Beyond the Nation State. Um, but, but this book made the argument that uh, in the European context, uh, economic integration in one area could spill over into others. Uh, and uh, one of the things that he emphasized about Europe was that there was a common political purpose uh, to the integration of Europe, and that was to prevent the recurrence of a Franco-Germanic war uh, in the European heartland. And so one of the things I think that we need to think about as we listen to the two presenters today is to what degree do we have a shared common political purpose? To what degree do we have a shared economic purpose? Purpose, and do we have a shared understanding of our security threats? So I'd, I'd encourage you to think about that as we go through the presentations and hopefully we can pick up on some of those themes uh, subsequently. Uh, the rules, uh, the ground rules are going to be that I'll uh, give uh, Bob 15 minutes uh, to speak and, uh, and then Jennifer uh, 10 minutes and that'll leave us, I hope, with plenty of opportunity for uh, a full discussion from the audience. Thank you very much and the floor is yours, Bob. Thank you. Thank you very much, Max. Uh, a great uh, American statesman, Yogi Berra, once said, uh, you can see a lot just by looking. Um, but if you've been looking at this conference on North America from here, it's been hard to see Mexico. Uh, uh, and indeed, Jennifer and I, I guess, are spokespeople on behalf of Mexico. And we both know that's not a very good way to do it. Uh, and there's a certain irony in this Canadian uh, strong uh, presence at this conference because Canada, in many ways, is the father of the new North America. It was Mexico's proposal to the United States for free trade agreement uh, that ultimately evoked from Canada a desire for a place at that table 
uh, admittedly for defensive reasons, uh, and voila, we saw no the North American Free Trade Agreement and the emergence of North America. So in many ways, Canada has been the father, but it's been uh, very dismissive of its offspring. Uh, to use an Oakland phrase, it's behaved like a deadbeat dad uh, to NAFTA. Uh, it has not uh, paid any attention uh, to Mexico. Indeed, it's betrayed its greatest purpose, and I say this from a person who has admired Canada for many years, for its multilateralism and for its generosity, uh, because it's been anti-multilateralist and very stingy in the region in which it's most, which is most important to Canada, that is to say, North America. Uh, the puzzle, therefore, which I will try to uh, address, is why uh, Canada, the most multilateral and generous nation in the world, has been the least multilateral and generous in, its own, in the region of greatest importance. And there are two other puzzles uh, that are associated with that. And the first is that or the second one is that Mexico, the weakest of the three, has been the boldest and the most imaginative. Uh, it was Mexico under Vicente Fox that proposed uh, deepening uh, NAFTA to a customs union, establishing a North American commission, looking towards cohesion funds, and it was, Mexi it was Canada that said no uh, to these bold initiatives. Uh, Bush, under the uh, uh, who was admittedly and unhypocritically anti-multilateralist, of course, was not interested in multilateral institutions. But it was really Canada that put a stop uh, to those bolder initiatives. And the third puzzle is, of course, the United States. Um, the United States, the richest and most powerful of the three, um, has uh, uh, been most worried about the loss of its sovereignty. Uh, in deepening economic integration. Uh, so uh, the irony there is that the strongest nation has historically been the one most interested in a divide and rule strategy. Uh, but in fact, in this case, it's been Canada uh, that has deployed uh, this strategy uh, rather than uh, the United States. So before answering those questions, let me take one step backwards and reflect on NAFTA. Uh, because as many of you know, uh, during the 2008 campaign and through many years, as Max alluded, uh, NAFTA became a veritable pinata for pandering pundits like Lou Dobbs and politicians like the two major Democratic candidates. Um, but if you look at NAFTA in terms of the specific objectives, that is to say, to, dis to dismantle trade and investment barriers and to expand trade and investment, uh, and to set up a dispute settlement mechanism, NAFTA was an astonishing success. Uh, so far, North America has quadrupled trade to over a trillion dollars. Uh, it has quintupled foreign direct investment, creating new North American firms uh, that, are, that were much more competitive. So in the specific goals of NAFTA, it was a success. But of course, it did not achieve a narrowing in the income gap between Mexico and its northern neighbors. Uh, and of course, it did not anticipate 9-11 uh, uh, with the new restrictions and the heavy transaction costs that by and large have displaced and, and increased uh, the, or replaced the, the tariffs that were eliminated by NAFTA by even greater costs. And as a result of what has happened since NAFTA exhausted itself in 2001 is we've seen the rise up until 2001 in seven years of North America as a powerful region, a formidable region whose share of world product increased from 30% in 1994 to 36% in 2001, uh, whose uh, uh, intra-regional trade as a percentage of its global trade increased from 42% to 56% in 2001. Since 2001, at its peak, we have declined as a regional entity. Uh, we have declined in terms of intra-regional trade down to about 51%. Uh, we have our rate of trade growth declined by half since 2001. And this occurred because our, we saw the enlargement of a market 
very much like what we saw with financial industry in the United States, but no governance. Governance did not keep pace. Uh, our governments did not build on this tremendous platform of NAFTA, and as a result, uh, we decline overall. Uh, so the question really is, where do we go from here? Uh, not only did we decline, but we reverted to this dysfunctional dual bilateralism, which has characterized U.S. relations with its two neighbors since uh, the 19th century, U.S.-Canadian relationship, U.S.-Mexican relationship. Uh, the promise of a North American relationship uh, was put aside, though occasionally our leaders uh, met in trilateral photo opportunities. They were basically dealing with dual bilateral uh, agendas. Uh, uh, Vicente Fox told me that at his first four trilateral summits, uh, the Canadian Prime Minister would pull off the U.S. President to talk about softwood lumber and only softwood lumber. He didn't even talk about softwood lumber in a context where he should have of public-private sectors and how do you trade in an integrated market in a public-private sector, which would have involved Mexico and would have permitted some more creative outcomes than what ultimately came out of uh, softwood lumber. Uh, he dealt with solely that issue. And as a result, softwood lumber was prolonged and costly uh, and, and underscored the lack of compliance on the part of the United States. And at the same time, the trucking problem of Mexico was not dealt with and still not been dealt with as well. Uh, so we've seen with this dual bilateralism a certain dysfunctionality uh, in inability to come to grips with the major problems of North America and allowed uh, North America to slide into decline. Now, why? Uh, and, and the only uh, option that was proposed was the so-called Security and Prosperity Partnership, which was an incremental interbureaucratic mechanism uh, that, as Roberta Jacobson succinctly described it yesterday, uh, involved no resources, no legislation, think small. And we saw that was counterproductive. Instead of trying to, to, to work below the public radar screen in a non-controversial way, actually it generated more suspicions of this so-called North American Union, uh, which uh, uh, Peter Schlag has just written about uh, in, in a very important book on immigration, um, but it produced no results. Um, so why? Why, to bring back to the puzzle of Canada, has it pursued this dual bilateralism? I think there are three arguments that have been made in Canada. Uh, the first is that Canada has this uniquely special relationship with the United States. Of course, the United States has special relationships with 192 countries, but the Canadian U.S. is, is very special from Ottawa's perspective. Um, and theoretically should produce some special outcomes for Canada. Now, it's been very hard to point to any of those outcomes, but nonetheless, that relationship is special. The second reason is the last thing Canada would want to do, Canada as pure as, as the snow in um, Vancouver, would want to do would be to associate with Mexico's violence and drug trafficking and all of these terrible things that Canada would feel better keeping its distance from. And the third is a more practical one. It's what Tom DeKino used to always refer to as three can talk, but two can do. It's a beautiful comment, but I don't see what was done by two uh, in the last uh, 20 years. So you have to ask yourself why. And I think the answer is that dual bilateralism is dysfunctional and it's time to replace it with a new vision of North America that takes off from where NAFTA is. Uh, Jennifer, will, who agrees with the new vision, will spell it out in some detail, but it's a, it's a simple one based on a simple premise of interdependence, which is that we all gain when one of us succeeds and we are all diminished when one of us fails. Uh, it had been Mexico that had been failing with the peso crisis, but more recently, we've all experienced when the United States financial crisis occurred. It will affect everybody, even that country, Canada, that has much better financial regulations. It's unavoidable. We are part of an interdependent uh, community, and therefore, we need to think about it. Now, this community will be different from Europe because we are different from Europe, and we can learn lessons from their experience. 
First lesson is we should, and this is a lesson that Charles Duran has pointed to uh, very eloquently, we should deepen before we widen. Before we start talking about Central America and Latin America and the Caribbean, let us see if we can make the three countries of North America work. Let us see if we can deal with the paramount challenge of North America uh, and our, our great opportunity, which is how do you narrow the income gap between Mexico and its two northern neighbors? If we can solve that problem among three countries, if we can create institutions that will work among the three countries, very easy to extrapolate and expand beyond that to include Central America, the Caribbean, and Latin America. But don't do it first. Don't go into 27 nations and start to create your institutions. That's one of the lessons of Europe. A second lesson uh, of Europe, uh, we learned actually the opposite lesson. Uh, uh, the, the, the Europe over-institutionalized, created too many supranational organizations, and in North America, we've created none. Uh, the one North American institution we created, uh, the Commission on Environmental Cooperation, Pierre Mark uh, Johnson yesterday pointed out to its utter failure. And that's the best one <laughs> that we created. Uh, and it's utter failure because there's a lack of any political support among the three countries, no resources. Uh, so we can learn from that. We can create lean advisory institutions rather than super national uh, intrusive institutions. Um, but, and we have a very ample agenda, and let me just run down the agenda quickly, uh, and then uh, offer a strategy to achieve that vision and that agenda. The first one, as I said, is the income gap, and we need a North American investment fund. NAFTA worked for Mexico, but only the northern part of Mexico that's connected to the North American market. The northern part of Mexico has been growing at 10 times faster than the south and the center, because it's connected. So the first lesson is also the lesson of the cohesion funds. Find a way to connect the south and center of Mexico to the North American market. And in fact, our exports will expand as quickly as President Obama would like it to expand, because Mexico and Canada are the two greatest markets for the United States. Um, and we should create this investment fund with a new model. Instead of the classic quid pro quo, Mexico, we will contribute to this investment fund, Mexico. If you open up your energy sector, if you uh, in, undertake important fiscal reform, we should define a community of interest and say, how are all three of us going to lift Mexico to the first world? What does each of us need to contribute to make this happen? Under those circumstances, our contribution would leverage the tough decisions in Mexico that they need to make to utilize those resources better. Secondly, the border. Um, uh, uh, I think yesterday uh, 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 we heard at some length how the border had gotten uh, uh, dumber and, uh, and thicker. And there is no question about that. And that Canada also cannot afford to make a mistake on the border. Well, there's a lot of ways that we can improve the border, and indeed, Ironically, we're starting to do that with Mexico, not with Canada. And the Canadian, and that's partly because Canadians have been telling us the two borders are so different. Well, Anne McClellan and I know, because we went down to Arizona, that the two borders are really not different. They suffer from the same dysfunctionality. Uh, there's inadequate infrastructure, there's too many restrictions, all of which have been compounded by 9-11. And we can solve the two borders at the same time. Indeed, I don't think we can solve them unless it's uh, together at the same time. And one way to do that is to, to do to a simple process. Instead of having duplicatives, uh, uh, Canadian truckers literally need 10 credentials to cross the borders. Um, and as a result, they're going out of business. Why not have one North American pass? Uh, why not, as part of a new border plan and a North American transportation uh, and infrastructure plan, which seems absolutely logical since trade uh, has tripled, but there had been no new highways, why not have one facility, uh, as Tom Pickering suggested, one set of customs forms, one pass? I don't think this is impossible to do, but I think it won't be easy. Uh, the rest of the agenda is huge in competitiveness and regulatory harmonization. Uh, how do we translate the concept of Buy American, which is growing in the United States, into 
not an exemption for Canada, but an exemption for North America. How about a buy North American plan as a way to get this vision uh, across? Um, uh, in terms of labor mobility between the United States and Canada, more difficult between the United States and Mexico. Uh, we've heard about climate change and strengthening the norm, North American Environmental Commission perhaps as a resource base, a monitoring base uh, for either a North American cap and trade system. We have a very ample agenda. The critical question is how do we get from here to there? And there, my argument for Canada is simple. The road to Washington should go through Mexico City. Um, uh, Ambassador Gottlieb has pointed out in his wonderful book and yesterday as well, that your problem is getting attention in Washington. Well, I can tell you that's not a problem for Mexico. Um, indeed, on Thursday night, President Obama spent the entire evening with the Congressional Hispanic Caucus, 30 members of Congress. Do you know that there are more Mexicans living in the United States than there are Canadians living in Canada. Uh, uh, now, this is, Mexico has two things that Canada does not have. It has constituencies, a constituency that's up for grabs by the two parties right now, uh, and it has crises, both of which are good at attracting attention. If Canada were to move through Mexico City and collaborate with them, they would both get the attention and channel the proposals in a way that would the U.S. would find it very difficult to say no to. Uh, if you're not ganging up on us but insisting on fair rules, I think these proposals would gain traction that Canada has not been able to get up until now. So uh, uh, is, it, is a community better than dual bilateralism? I don't think there's any question. First, you have rules, not an imbalance of power. Uh, that will define the way we relate to each other, which is what we have right now. Uh, we have a new perspective that comes to the table. Instead of the Sinatra doctrine, you do it our way or forget it, which is the reason that the U.S. and Canada haven't been able to work out a preclearance facility across uh, uh, Buffalo, uh, because each side said, this is the only way we're going to do it, uh, and we just fail to do it. You introduce a third party to that, and all of a sudden, some of this can break down. We can move to a new JLO doctrine. Uh, 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 the US government under Bush uh, was anti-multilateral. We heard yesterday from Ber Roberta Jacobson, this is a pro-multilateral administration, but it's one that is deluged with an agenda. She invited. She invited Canada to join with Mexico to propose this kind of agenda uh, and said that perhaps that might be the only way of moving uh, this forward. So in summary and in conclusion, uh, I think that there is much that Canada can do. Canada's strength has been creating international institutions. Let's think about what those institutions should be. We don't have an anti-institutional administration now. We can return to some of the ideas of a North American uh, uh, tribunal on, on investment and trade. We could think about uh, a North American uh, interparliamentary committee. Jim Colby proposed that and it was rejected by Canada. Uh, in joining the U.S.-Canadian, U.S.-Mexican interparliamentary committee, a North American investment fund, strengthening the North American uh, Development Bank. Uh, uh, we should recognize what Daniel Burnham, a great Chicago engineer, once said, make no little plans. They have no magic to stir man's blood. Uh, make big plans. I think we're more likely to have greater success in North America if we think larger, we collaborate among all three, and we are more likely to succeed than if we, start, if we continue doing it on a bilateral and incremental basis. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jennifer Jeffs. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to uh, I'm going to pick up on uh, on basically two things that that Bob has said, and I'm going to expand on something that came up yesterday. So first of all, I'll talk about uh, a new vision for North America. Um, I will talk about Mexico as a route 
to Washington for Canada, and I will also talk about uh, North America, a regional entity, uh, as a global, as a potential global force. So, uh, Pastor describes the, um, the, the, the decline of NAFTA, and I think that this really, what we're looking at here is the, the, the need for more competitiveness. So, the fact that globalization makes the region more important, not less important, in terms of being competitive. And uh, he blames the fact the decline of economic growth and integration on the fact that institutions were not built to support this continental vision. Now, I think it's I think it's really important to understand that NAFTA is only one element of what has become a complex, multi-dimensional North American system, um, which in courage could become much more integrated and powerful. And I think we need to move away from a vision of what to a vision of how. And here, you know. Uh, um, in opposition to our realist friends from yesterday, I think we want to look at not so much at incomes, at sorry, at outcomes, but as processes. I think the culture, building a culture of North America involves process that we haven't really thought about very deeply. Um, NAFTA was also a government to government approach. Uh, Bob, Bob himself, I think, works very much in a government, national government to national government model. And uh, as Jeremy Kinsman yesterday referred to Anne-Marie Slaughter's concept of a networked world, I think in a networked world, we have to look beyond national governments. We want to look at local communities, local governments. We want to look at NGOs, academic institutions, um, professional organizations, other, other ways of, of communicating and other ways of, uh, of actually committing to a process. So uh, first of all, in terms of process, the private sector needs to get involved. I think there's no, there's absolutely no doubt about that. Uh, we should reconsider some of the initiatives of the North American Committee, the, uh, the task force that was put together by the Council on Foreign Relations. Um, engage the corporations with the North American focus. Uh, Bob points out in his paper that most global corporations are, are very strong regionally. And uh, the Forbes business list just came out recently. And you see that uh, General Electric, number one in the Forbes of 2000, uh, no, Forbes 2000 list, um, obviously has great, huge operations in North America. Walmart um, was, a couple of years ago at least, the largest employer in Mexico and in the US, the largest private employer and a very significant one in Canada. So these, these are the sorts of companies we should be looking at. George Weston sold 20% uh, of its U US ho holdings a few months ago to Grupo Bimbo, uh, a Mexican conglomerate. So these are, these are significant forces that have a real vested interest in the reducing of income inequalities in Mexico and the development of Mexico and the rise of a middle class, a consumer middle class in Mexico. And they should be much more engaged than they have been. Um, a real opportunity here exists for public-private partnerships. Um, and I think that the, the engagement of the private sector, and I think it came up yesterday about a special envoy. I think that would be something, a good job for an envoy to do, is to go to these private sector companies and get them involved in, uh, in a North American initiative. Lots of, there are lots of, uh, you know, lots of possibilities here, and I have lists of them which I can, which I can share for you, but I, I have limited time, so I, I won't go through them all. Um, but, well, now weaving a tapestry um, of North America-focused initiatives from a variety of sources can capture the imagination that maybe NAFTA couldn't. And I think when we look at energy, cooperation, and environmental issues, I think that's po possibly a new vision of North America will probably come. A really well-articulated one will come from an environmentalist, because environmental issues obviously are not national. They're not regional either. but. It's, uh, this, is a, this, this is another point that I really want to develop, that uh, if North America can make progress at the regional level on global issues, then it really has a powerful voice and a legitimate voice, the combination of a hegemon, a middle power, and a developing country that have actually addressed certain issues successfully could be a really powerful global force. And I think we haven't thought about that enough. Um, Jennifer Welsh talks about the fact that the way that the European countries uh, relate to each other and the values they promote in their relations with each other defines their foreign policy. I think we can, we can really apply that idea to, uh, to North America. Um, the uh, relevant global issues that the region itself could address would be I mean, thinking about development and aid, fragile states, uh, partnership, partnerships in energy and the environment, health issues. 
there, there are numerous ones, and I guess I would sort of I would challenge the audience here. We're all a, lot, a group of very intelligent people to think of, of of partnerships that would actually be very effective in a North American context that we could take to the global to the global arena. Um, so, with the back, back to bilateral relationships, with Canada, the U.S. relationship is obviously the Canadian focus and the key to their economic prosperity. That's the way that they, they think about it. Therefore, Canada has to understand the U.S. concern, even call it a fixation with Mexico. And uh, that's something, Bob, I just want to sort of expand on what Bob said because it's so important. And I don't think we really understand that in Canada. You know, that 30% of foreign born Americans and almost 60% of their illegal residents are Mexican. Mexican. This affects their domestic policy as well as their foreign policy. And uh, I think that Canada really needs to understand that engaging Mexico could be a fundamental aspect of a foreign policy that prioritizes the U.S. Uh, the prevailing attitude seems to be that including Mexico is messy and cumbersome, as Bob pointed out. But in fact, I think it's, 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 you know, it's, uh, it's fundamental to, to the way we relate to the United States. And I think that's a mistake that Canada has made in the past. Um, Joe Clark and I were at the Sum of the Americas, and uh, certainly I'd never talked to Joe about this afterwards, but I was just there as an observer. And to see how the, the Canada just totally missed the boat, they came with their free trade agenda, and meanwhile the U.S. was talking energy and environment partnerships. We were just, we were so out, we didn't do our research. What did the U.S. want to get out of the Summit of the Americas? Let's not make the mistake, the same mistake with Mexico. And there's so many ways we can engage with Mexico, and we can look at what the U.S. is doing. There, there are lots of initiatives that we could help with. There are lots of initiatives we could take ourselves, but they're, you know, they're, they're um, digitizing, digitizing corporate procedures. So they're investing a lot of money in that. We could help. They're making a registry of police officers. We have the OPP apparently has done this in some very new uh, digital way. We could help there. You know, we could maybe we can't commit the same amount of resources that the U.S. can, but we can certainly supplement what they are doing. And uh, the uh, appointment of Carlos Pascual, one of the deepest thinkers on Mexican issues as the American ambassador is very indicative of how the Americans are, they're, they're in there. They're in with Mexico for the long haul, and Canadians have to embrace that. And in fact, the other, th the other thing I really wanted to stress was the, uh, the youth interest in Mexico, in Canada. I think we need to, we need to develop that. We need to strengthen our, strengthen our educational exchanges. And the young people, we need to capture their imagination. There are so few students in Canada studying North America, so few students studying Canada-US relations. It's just not exciting, it's not sexy, it's much more interesting for students to study China, to study India. If we bring Mexico into the North American equation, we will capture the imagination of young people and we need those young people. The, 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 uh, the statistics about PhD theses coming out about Canada-US relations are, are abysmal. We just don't have, we don't have, we need to generate more interest and I think that including Mexico is a very good way to do that. So I'll stop there, but uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, let, let me make just one quick observation before we open the floor for a discussion, and it really picks up on some of the things that I said at the very beginning, and that is, I'd like to, I'd like to, Bob, I think one of the things that Bob does really well is he knows how to push the buttons of Canadians and tell Canadians that we're not really multilateralists in, in North America, I think is something that's sure to, to sort of provoke discussion. And I'd like to sort of reflect a little bit on that, because it seems to me there's a sense in which the original logic that supported NAFTA was an essentially multilateralist logic. Uh, and, but the, the logic of uh, North American community that Bob has articulated really in some ways is quite different from that original con uh, understanding uh, in, in the following sense. Part of the idea behind NAFTA was that it was going to generate a process of competitive liberalization. Right? What that meant was that the U United States could use the fact that it's the largest market in the world as a source of, uh, of leverage in bilateral negotiation to offer to countries in the Americas access to the U.S. market and to U.S. investment and to use the enormous attraction of that as leverage to promote economic reforms that Washington believed that the rest of the hemisphere needed to pursue. This was sort of the, the, the Washington consensus. Uh, and, and that logic was ultimately uh, a multilateralist one in the sense that the idea was as countries uh, lined up to make themselves more attractive 
to U.S. investors and to gain access to the U.S. market, they would undertake the kinds of reforms, privatization of state-owned enterprises, deregulation, opening up their markets to foreign trade, encouraging foreign investment. These, this process uh, would result in a kind of a serial incorporation of more and more countries into an expanding um, uh, Western Hemispheric zone of free trade that would begin with NAFTA and ultimately would encompass the entire Western Hemisphere. And, and by the time it encompassed the entire Western Hemisphere, presumably at a certain point, uh, it, 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 could, it could be integrated with the World Trade Organization. So, so all, the long-term goal was global liberalization, using competitive liberalization on a regional basis uh, as the mechanism to get there. And I think that that logic was fundamentally flawed in a number of respects. It was flawed in the sense that, first of all, it didn't deal with the issue of inequality and development, which I think Bob has really put on the table. But it also bought off the winners. As companies gain access to the countries that they want to do business in, uh, you, you take the steam out of the pressure for further liberalization. And it turns out that not all countries did line up to join. Some did and some didn't. Other countries felt excluded. And so you, in fact, got this polarization, which I think has resulted in uh, the growth of sort of the left turns in Latin America and the unprecedented independence that many Latin American countries are now seeking um, from, from the United States. And so, in fact, rather than seeing this process of, of, of competition for liberalization, we're seeing uh, growing polarization. And it really seems to me that Ottawa is the last place where the Washington consensus still exists. Mm -hmm. Ottawa is the last country that is still pursuing uh, this logic of competitive liberalization. Much of the rest of the hemisphere has, has kind of given up on it. And I, I, we really need to replace it, I think, with the kind of vision that Bob has articulated that puts equity, development, um, and deeper integration at the center of, 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 of our attention. I'll, if you want to respond to that, yeah. you can. Yeah, I'd like to because I think it's a very thoughtful question. Um, but actually, my, you know, while I agree with Max on almost everything, on this one, I, I have slight disagreement. And I think the, the, uh, the response might illuminate several other issues. Actually, I, th uh, I think you are absolutely right that the original idea of NAFTA is different than the one that I'm trying to discuss right now. I think it's a second generation uh, idea that, I'm, that we're talking about now in this vision of a North American community. Uh, the original idea of NAFTA was actually uh, uh, developed philosophically by that other great uh, uh, Canadian um, a stateswoman who was not invited to this one, but whose thought on this issue is the most profound. It was Lily Tomlin. Um, uh, Lily Tomlin once said, together we are in this alone. Uh, uh, and that was really the original philosophy of NAFTA. Uh, it was three sovereign governments maintaining their absolute sovereignty and agreeing to the simplest, leanest idea of just dismantling trade and investment barriers, and that would be enough. Um, and it was not enough. In that sense, you're absolutely right. But the origin of that, actually, of, of, of the NAFTA and its relationship to the Washington Consensus is, is the reverse of what you suggested. Uh, I don't believe that uh, even George Herbert Walker Bush, who, in comparison to his son, seems like a genius nowadays, um, <laughs> Uh, but who had this vision problem, uh, you recall. Um, I, I, don't, I think he, he didn't really have this idea of promoting NAFTA as a way to liberalize the uh, world community. Actually, it was Salinas. And it was Salinas's idea, which is so much more powerful, because he did represent a 180-degree turn for Mexico, a 180-degree turn by himself over an 18-month period. Uh, he was not in favor of free trade. Uh, I interviewed him uh, uh, two days after his election in 1988, and I'd asked him this many times in the past, and he said free trade is a crazy idea. Uh, 18 months later, he proposed it. Um, and one of the reasons he proposed it was to lock in the economic reforms uh, and the liberalization that they'd begun on their own. So he understood that very well, and that's what he, that was one of his purposes. Uh, but to get back to the, to the point of departure, I think there is a, now a moment for us to think broadly. And I, uh, broadly for North America, and I wouldn't extend it, tank, frankly, as I said before, to the whole of the Americas for a number of reasons. One is that the whole of the Americas now is fractured so badly that it will take a long time to get it back into a place that, that they would be open to this. But more importantly, it's going to be hard enough 
to make our three countries come up with a community, come up with the institutions. So you don't want to have more people at the table. <laughs> three is enough right now. Good. Thank you very much. Let's throw the floor open. Uh, uh, Joe Clark, I think, uh, Abe Lowenthal. I'm going to take three or four questions. That's okay. <laughs> Thanks. The, um, uh, I think this concept is very much worth pursuing, and I think it becomes more worth pursuing uh, than it might have been before and more practical. But I want to speak to, a, to one of Bob's premises, which was that there was a deliberate beachhead with respect to Mexico established in Canada at the time of NAFTA. I just don't believe that was true. Uh, the transformative debate about trade in Canada was the free trade agreement. It was the bilateral arrangement with the United States of America. It was transformative. It was very difficult. It involved uh, fundamental changes in attitude, and it worked. Uh, frankly, taking nothing away from the, uh, uh, the, the work that was done to achieve NAFTA, the NAFTA debate did not attract much attention in Canada. It was a reverse situation in the United States. The free trade debate with Canada was not a, ma a big item here. Uh, the NAFTA debate was. Put that into the other context about uh, the, the political impact and the demographic impact of Mexico upon the United States. That just does not exist in Canada. Uh, I quoted figures yesterday indicating the disproportionate degree to which U.S. in-migration is coming from, from Latin countries, almost exclusively Mexico, and that is not the case in Canada. Our in-migration, which is transforming our country in its own ways, is coming from other places. So, if we're going to proceed realistically on this, we should not assume the premise of a beachhead from which there has been a retreat. There has to be a beachhead built. And it may well be, I'm persuaded that there is, uh, more reason to build that beachhead now in Canada than there was before. I also am skeptical, if I may say, about uh, the road to Canada's road to Washington uh, going through uh, Mexico. I won't elaborate on that. I'm skeptical uh, about that. But the beachhead question, I think, is critical. Uh, let's uh, collect a couple more questions in the interest of time. I think we've got Abe and Jeremy and a, yes, a gentleman here. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, if I'm permitted, a brief comment on that question. Uh, we came up from Los Angeles basically motivated by this panel, and it was well worth the trip. Terrific uh, panel. Uh, um, the, the comment is this. I'm not sure whether the road to, for Canada to Washington is, is uh, through Mexico. But I would submit the proposition that the road to the North American vision may very well be, in part at least, through California. Uh, and I think it's a very good idea that you have this partnership between uh, UC Berkeley and uh, University of British Columbia. I think that for three reasons. First, because California has both a large Mexican and a large Canadian presence. Uh, m most states that have one don't have the other. Uh, second, because California is the center of, uh, or a, a major center of knowledge and culture uh, production. Uh, I'm thinking here of the universities, of uh, the internet uh, sectors, uh, and of Hollywood, uh, which shape culture in so many ways. Uh, and third, because it is such a center for the knowledge production uh, centers uh, and industries more generally. Uh, so I, I would invite you to incorporate that thought into your, into your thinking. Um, the question is this. It takes into account Max's uh, uh, first comment in introducing the session where he, he asked about uh, common visions, among other things, of security, whether they were such. Uh, and Bob, your recent comment uh, just a moment ago about whether the vision should be broadened in the Western Hemisphere. Um, the question I have is this. Might it not serve the interest of the North American idea uh, to have a more explicit and sustained focus in discussions and interchanges among Mexicans, uh, Canadians, and people from the United States about the common interests that the three 
have with regard to Central America and the Caribbean, which, in which both Canada and Mexico and the U.S. have a, 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 a much larger presence than they do in other, in other international arenas, um, and where I think there are deep problems which will affect all three countries. And there might be ways of really turning that into something that can help reinforce the North American idea. I have the gentleman over here, I think. And one quick comment, and that I was there when the man from Salinas' government came to the Prime Minister's office and told us that they wanted to have a bilateral or a free trade agreement with the U.S. And our immediate reaction was that that was a bad idea for us. Uh, it may have been good for Mexico, but we needed to have a trilateral arrangement if we were going to protect our own interests. So that's, that's where it started from. There was no particular vision of relationship with Mexico involved from our perspective. But I have, there's a, the presumption running through the discussion is that more integration is a good thing. Uh, and I'm going to ask a question whether it really is. Is it really better? Is this really in our interests? to have closer integration. And I'm not thinking just of Mexico, I'm thinking Mexico and Canada, uh, and the United States, I should say. Um, we have a very successful economy. We have a pretty good relationship up and down. Sometimes, you know, we could, could, we could possibly be richer, but we're pretty rich. We have a very effective relationship and we have considerable independence. Uh, I know that Alan Gottlieb has written, I don't know where Alan is sitting, but he's, he, perhaps he's not here. He's written that if you could get to a situation where you could have Canada-US economic relationship governed by laws and not by politics, uh, that we would be inherently better off. But we've seen in the North American Free Trade Agreement, and we've seen in, in, in the Free Trade Agreement, that you can't get that. We didn't get that. We got two kind of, uh, we, we got a kind of Rube Goldbergian dispute settlement mechanism based on national laws. And we've, and we've been attacked on stuff like softwood lumber over and over again. And my guess is that that's not over yet either. So in what respect, uh, what do we get out of closer integration? And what do we give up in closer integration? And comparisons with Europe, frankly, don't persuade me at all. Europe is a very different place than North America is. Uh, so my fundamental question is, why is this better? There must be a reason why all those Canadians don't think it's better, um, and perhaps Americans and even Mexicans. So why are you guys so persuaded that this is such a great thing? Thank you very much. I'm going to let the, um, the panelists respond, and then I've got three more speakers, and we'll have to close it out. Jeremy uh, Kinsman, Greg Croft, and Jeffrey Simpson. And then I think we're going to have to close with that because we are going to be approaching lots. I've been told by the conference organizers we can go a little bit over time, but I think we've got to wrap it up at that. So, so Bob and, and uh, Jennifer, do you want to say a few things now and then we'll take the final three questions? Okay. Um, first of all, thank you for the questions. Um, uh, and thank you, Abe, for coming from LA. I'm very uh, complimented by, by your journey and appreciate your comments. I think first with regard to uh, both Joe's comment on uh, and Paul re reiterated, I, I am aware that Canada joined, that, that Canada's critical decision was the U.S.-Canadian Free Trade Agreement, there's no doubt, and that it did uh, join in the Mexican for largely defensive reasons. I think that's absolutely clear. And I think Joe is correct too, I have no doubt, that. Uh, uh, that, uh, you know, the idea of developing the relationship with Mexico is not, doesn't represent, uh, uh, the current policy doesn't represent a retreat, it just doesn't represent any advance, um, uh, which one would have hoped uh, would have occurred. Um, uh, I think, let me go to Paul's question, come back to, to Abe's if I can, because I think, uh, I think your question is, is, is really the central one. Is closer integration better? Uh, my answer to that is, yes, it is better, but it's also, uh, uh, it's also much more difficult and potentially dangerous, uh, particularly for the smaller countries, which is precisely why uh, standing in place is not really a good option. Um, you know, it's like, you know, they, they, the analogy of riding a bicycle, you just can't 
stop riding the bicycle and expect to stay on the bicycle. You're going to fall down. And that's what we've seen since 2001. Integration is better because, uh, as we know from the very large markets that exist within our three countries, this is a source of great economies of scale and ultimately of wealth and improvement in standard of living. And the question of moving from these three national markets to a continental market will give us even more. Uh, simple principle of comparative advantage. And we've already seen in the first eight years how it could improve uh, the standard of living uh, of, of the three countries. So there's no doubt in my mind that the creation of a, of a unified market improves the standard of living of our people, which is a critical ingredient, but it does much more than that. If we can take it to the next generation of integration, of sort of regulatory harmonization, uh, uh, which is the next generation, as each of our countries naturally want to deepen our regulations to improve the safety and health of our people and the environmental quality of our people, if we can do that in a continental way, uh, that can be the basis of, of, of a lot of global initiatives, very similar to what has happened with the world trading system, which is also stuck right now. And I think the region could be a laboratory for the global trading system. Uh, but it's difficult for all of the reasons that we mentioned, and it's dangerous for the two weaker members. It's particularly dangerous for Mexico, which has experienced both the greatest gains from NAFTA and also the greatest losses. Uh, volatility is inherent in the weakest member. Canada is a little bit more protected uh, than Mexico, but still, you know, you are, you know, you are the size of the Californian economy, not com as compared to the national economy, uh, and that is all the argument that I've been making for why we have to move forward. And you have to look towards new kinds and deeper forms of integration if you're going to make it work. By not going forward towards a customs union, a common external tariff, we actually created an opening for China, which they exploited unbelievably well. You know, they only have to come into one port in the United States in their goods. Our North American cars have to cross seven borders. Uh, in a post 9-11 world that transformed the North American advantage into a disadvantage economically. So we have to move forward. We can't stay where we are. Uh, I, think, um, uh, I think Abe on the California connection, one thing that hit me, I mean, I've been going more to LA than to San Francisco. And in LA, of course, the second largest city of Mexico is Los Angeles. We think it's an American city, but um, my, my Mexican friends, always tell me the reason they like LA so much is because it's so close to the United States. Uh, 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 but you come to San Francisco and Mexico doesn't exist here. It's Canada that's here. It's two different states. I, didn't, I thought California was one state, but I guess it's really two different states. So I think once California figures a way to integrate itself, then maybe it could be more of a bridge with the two countries. I think your last question is, is a very good one on Central America and the Caribbean. What I was trying to say is that what we should do in North America is build institutions within North America, take the next level of integration within North America. But that doesn't mean that we forget about Central America and the Caribbean. It means that we, we integrate it later after we make this work. But the idea that you proposed is a great one. That is an opportunity for the three countries to have a foreign policy to Central America and the Caribbean and to talk about what we can do in Central America. Canada, of course, has special relations with certain parts of the Caribbean, the US uh, with certain parts of Central America. It's a, it's a logical uh, step. OK. Jennifer, do you want to add? No, I, I guess on the, on the question of integration, I think that uh, uh, to, speaking from a political standpoint, I don't know if Canadians really realize how close Mexico came um, to, to, I don't know, I, C catastrophe, something, something really bad with uh, with uh, Obrador when Calderon was elected. That was that was a very very tense time, and uh, it was a very tense time in Mexico, and I think it was a very tense time in the United States. And I don't think I think we were protected up here. I don't think we realized the extent of the dissatisfaction, and I think that this is Mexico is it has one or two more chances really to to be a liberal capitalist democracy. I think that there's a there's a big voice in the south. And we just saw the meeting that there was held, the Rio meeting that was held a couple of weeks ago in Cancun. It could
could turn the other way. You know, the domestic politics in Mexico are complicated, and I think that that's something Canada doesn't really realize to the extent that, that the Americans do. Okay, if I could ask the last three participants to be very brief, please. Uh, Jeremy. Yeah, well, I, uh, I certainly endorse uh, this concept and have argued a lot that it'd be part of this conference. But that being said, Bob, I think you go at this the wrong way, okay? Stop blaming Canada, okay? Uh, Canada has real problems with the United States. Uh, Gottlieb uh, listed our, the fact that the FDA's gains have basically been eroded by 9-11. These are real problems. There is a perception in Canada, and I share your dislike of it. There is a political perception in Canada that associating ourselves with Mexico on border issues works to our disadvantage. One, it takes the oxygen, the Canadian oxygen out of the air because the Mexican problem is the bigger problem. Two, for all of the reasons that you said, constituency and crisis, uh, the Americans are more driven by what's going on in Mexico. But listen, we acknowledge the relationships, the bilateral relationships are dysfunctional, but it doesn't reduce at all the necessity for trying to make the Canada-US relationship functional. You got to do more than one thing at the same time. We've got to do trilateralism, but it's not a substitute for getting the bilateral relationship right. Secondly, just to quit as a democracy activist, I have to say that what Jennifer said is the answer to Paul's question. There are 31 million people in the middle class in Mexico who are discovering democracy for the first time. I tell you, what's going on there because of violence, because of drugs, our drugs, uh, is putting this up for grabs. And we have a responsibility. And it is classic multilateralism in the sense that we're going there to do good, and I don't mean that in any patronizing way. The Mexicans need us there, and that's the reason to go. Thanks. I had a question directed mostly at Jennifer because she had made a comment that towards this goal of a deeper NAFTA, which I, by the way, support, one of the, the better early approaches was to be a look at environmental cooperation. I was really surprised by that because at least at the time NAFTA was coming up, the Sierra Club opposed it. And, and my impression has been that environmental organizations have, have actually in many cases opposed uh, deeper integration. And I was wondering you know, the logic by which she came to that, the conclusion that, that environmental cooperation, I don't, don't get me wrong, I think it's eminently sensible to cooperate, especially in the border areas. I'm just curious why you came to the conclusion that that was one of the easier approaches to uh, deeper cooperation. Thank you. Okay, the last uh, was for Jeffrey Simpson at the back. Um, this is just a statement of fact, which I'd like to get your response to. Last um, July, the government of Canada imposed visas on Mexicans. Both Mexican airlines have canceled flights and pulled out of Canadian markets. Air Canada has reduced flights, and the January and December statistics showed a 65% drop in Mexicans to Canada. Perhaps you'd like to factor that into your more high-minded views of where we're going? Just a few seconds to respond, and then we'll, we'll wrap up. Uh, well, Jeremy, of course, uh, I love Canada. In fact, I, I, uh, I don't want to blame Canada, but I did want to push some buttons, and if I push your button, that's great. Um, but I want you to know that I actually rooted for Canada in the hockey game, the final. Uh, that just shows, me, shows you how much I really love Canada. Uh, I root for Mexico when they play soccer. I root for the United States when it plays baseball. Uh, I believe that's part of this community vision. Uh, um, uh, I, uh, I do, I tried to make the argument, and I will just underscore it. I think after eight years, uh, I would hope that Canada would wake up and realize that it has made no progress on thinning the border. And I think you are in for a huge surprise. Uh, and that is that the U.S. and Mexico are about to make progress uh, on the border issues. 
in ways that would benefit Canada if Canada were at the table. Um, and that's why it should be at the table. And if Canada were at the table, I think the outcome would be that much better. And that's the argument I was trying to make. Uh, secondly, you're absolutely right about democracy, and I'll underscore it by a single point, which is that if you look at the geographical map of Mexico, not only do the richer north of Mexico um, grow 10 times faster because of NAFTA, but the richer north of Mexico voted for the PAN right across the board. Um, so that your argument is even truer and even more powerful for the North American Investment Fund. Mexico actually is in danger of being two nations, and Canada knows something about that. Um, but this is a different kind. This is a really class-based um, uh, uh, division, which is much more serious. And we can, we can contribute, Canada and, Canada and the US, to, to breaking that down and to uniting Mexico within a larger North America with this North American Investment Fund. Um, Jeffrey Simpson, there is simp I, I didn't understand. I was with the Mexican foreign minister the day that, uh, that, um, uh, that Canada snapped this visa policy down on behalf of refugees, and it still puzzles me because if Canada simply adhered to the international definition of a refugee, uh, which is a person with a well-founded fear of persecution, they could have joined with Mexico in acknowledging that there are no Mexicans who can be refugees to Canada, therefore there is no need for a Mexican to apply for refugee status in Canada, and you would have not only solved the problem, but you could still solve a problem that hasn't been solved yet. Jennifer. Uh, okay, on the uh, on the environmental uh, file, I I think man, I probably wasn't clear enough. I'm really talking about NGOs, the NGO groups. Um, just an example: Carlos Slim has given the World Wildlife Fund in Mexico 100 million dollars, saying find some uh, partners, find some partners for a conservation project in North America. You know that's a that's a that's a large amount of money, and that could be a very powerful partnership, and that's uh, through an NGO. So I'm thinking much more about uh, processes outside governmental organizations. And on the visa question, I mean, I, I couldn't agree more. I think that uh, I've spoken to, the, the, to Guillermo down there, the ambassador, several times about this. And he, he said, look, we kept on warning the Mexicans. We kept on telling them we were going to do this unless they gave us some signals that they were going to take care of the problem from their end. I think that's a fairly weak argument. Um, it is, it is, it's terrible. I think that Mexican-Canadian relations are actually at a low point right now from, from, uh, from what they were. And I think that's really, that's really tragic. So I'm not. Please join me in thanking the panelists for their presentations. Yeah.